evening, everyone. I'm Chris Stover from the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs. I'd like to welcome you here tonight. SACEPA is an organization co-founded by St. Mary's University and the Atlantic School of Theology. It's an organization with a mandate to provide an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in our society. SACEPA does this in three ways, through public presentations, through research fellowships, and assisting organizations in developing ethics frameworks. SACEPA seeks to assist organizations and individuals in the integration of ethics into public practices and policies. Our public presentations are designed to inform the debate and facilitate informed choices. SACEPA does this through open and respectful debate on contemporary public issues, providing a balance of perspectives on a broad range of ethical concerns. This balance doesn't always come in one night, nor on one specific issue, as some concerns are simply too large to accommodate in one conversation. SACEPA achieves its broader balance through the spectrum of discussions that it hosts throughout the entire program year. You won't always like or agree with what you hear at a SACEPA event, but hopefully it will work to mediate ethical concerns through a process of critical listening and engagement. The aim is to enhance our capacity to address ethical challenges and controversies, to be provocative and compelling. And to do that, we sometimes need to hear more than our own voice echoed back. SACEPA needs to provide a forum for communities to identify and discuss concerns, clarify underlying sources of ethical problems and disagreements, and encourage inclusion in discussion and decision making. So tonight we'll talk about oil and learn about Canadian author Andrew Nikiforek's perspective. And hopefully we'll hear yours too in the question and answer period. We're grateful to have the support of the philosophy department here at St. Mary's, as well as Seaburn, the Canadian Business Ethics Research Network, as sponsors. I'd like to welcome tonight also our live stream audience and invite you to participate in the question period through the, uh, the chat feature on your screen. I'll encourage you also to use the evaluation button on your screen to let us know what you think of tonight's presentation. And for those of you here in the room, I've provided a piece of paper that I hope you'll fill in. And now I'll hand things over to my colleague, Dr. Ryland Higgins, in Anthropology Department here at St. Mary's University, who has been hugely instrumental in the development of this element series. And he will formally introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. I'm pretty sure hugely developmental is, or whatever, how you phrase it, is an overstatement. <clears throat> I'm nonetheless uh, very honored to introduce tonight's speaker, Andrew Nikiforik. I had the pleasure of having dinner with Andrew this evening, uh, and during that dinner he explained when I asked him how I might introduce him to keep it uh, short and honest. For those of you who know me, this is a bit of a new undertaking, so I will do my best. <laughs> In the broadest terms, I would describe Andrew as a writer and a thinker. In my opinion, he's spending time writing and researching uh, very important topics, timely to the world, timely to Canada, and at our current juncture on a number of issues. Um, within the realm of sort of environmental issues, he's uh, spent time researching and writing about melting glaciers, about peak oil, and about the destruction of the boreal rainforest, to name a few. Um, he also has gone outside the realm of the environmental issues and done research and written both um, popularly available um, and reports on such uh, issues as education and HIV AIDS. And for this work, all right, um, he's been awarded um, uh, writing in a number of uh, publications, written in uh, The Walrus, which I hope some of you are familiar with, also Maclean's, uh, Canadian Business, and also The Globe and Mail's uh, Report on Business. The awards he has received uh, include many, all right? Uh, I'll just list a couple of here. Um, he received the, G the Governor General's Award for Nonfiction in 2002 for his book, um, nonfiction book, uh, Saboteurs, Weibo Ludwig's War Against Big Oil. Also in 2009, 
the Rachel Carson, is that right? The Rachel Carson Environmental Book Award, which is um, um, given out by the U.S. based Society for Journalism, Environmentalists, sorry, um, Journalism, uh, for his book, Tar Sands, Dirty Oil and the Future of the Continent. Um, his upcoming book, due out when? In the fall, In the fall uh, is entitled The Energy of Slaves, Oil and the, the New Servitude. Um, the language there, the title might indicate um, that Andrew is perhaps maybe not the uh, loudest or most commonly heard voice on such topics, but I would argue perhaps uh, one of the most important. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure and it's a great honor to be here tonight. And I want to thank the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs uh, for the invitation to come and speak. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Chris Stover for ar arranging this event. And as I told her tonight, uh, Chris, you've invited me to speak about something outside of Alberta that I would not be uh, probably invited to, to do so within Alberta. Um, I think the time will come, uh, but I welcome the opportunity here. I love Halifax. I love the scale of the city. I love your conviviality, your friendliness uh, as, as a people, as a community. Now, I have some rather disturbing things to talk about tonight, um, and I hope to do so with some humor and uh, some lightness. And uh, it's always a dangerous thing for an author, once he's finished a book, to sort of then stand up and, and talk about it, especially before it's uh, being published. You can see my business sense is all out of sorts here. And um, um, so it, it's, this is the first time I, I have given this, this, this talk. And so it is a work in progress. I, it, 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 I will be thinking out loud uh, in some ways. But basically, I want to really uh, give you different ways of thinking not only about oil, because I'll be both praising it and damning it, but also about energy. And I'll, by the way, I'll be both praising and damning renewables as well. Um, and, you know, C.S. Lewis, the Christian philosopher, once told a marvelous story um, about an Irishman who... Uh, uh, decided he'd get a wood stove. And the wood stove did such a marvelous job that it cut his fuel bill by half. Uh, so he bought another wood stove thinking that uh, he wouldn't have a fuel, fuel bill at all. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's this whole idea that we will kind of sacrifice our soul to get some power. And, 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 and it, it's very much ingrained in our thinking um, about oil. Now, the incredible thing about oil is that it's changed everything. It's changed our attitude towards economics. It's changed our attitudes towards the scale of cities. It's changed our thinking about gender. I'm not going to get too much into that tonight. Um, it's, it's changed our work relationships. It's changed our attitudes about science. Um, it's inflated and changed the metabolism of just about everything on the planet in the last 150 years. And so I'm going to tell some of those stories, but how we got to where we are today and where we're going with oil and what's going to happen as oil becomes more expensive, more extreme, and more difficult. And uh, it, uh, my suggestion here is that we are already in a transition but it is not the transition we expected. And the transition we are in is one of economic contraction due to the rising cost of oil. And we are not prepared. So this marvelous commodity, and, and, and it is such in the sense that there is no other form of energy on the planet that is, that is as versatile um, and as portable and as, as densely full of energy as oil. It's why we have been so thoroughly seduced by this product. 
Now, if you look at this, this kind of map, you'll sort of our, our, our diagram, you get a sense of our scale of oil's importance in energy use globally. All right, so let's pretend that the world, let's not pretend this is, these are the, the essential statistics, that the world consumes 15 terawatts of energy a year. Okay? About six, six of those 15 terawatts all comes from oil. The majority of the terawatts all comes from fossil fuels, coal and oil and natural gas. Nuclear is only 6% of this and renewables are almost an infinitesimal amount of the mix. So it would be safe to say right now the world is running, uh, 80, getting 85% of its energy from fossil fuels and more than a third of that is coming from oil. Now we all know how Americans live and how we live. And we know to raise global population to U.S. oil standards would require a five-fold increase, so from this 15 to 17 terawatts, to 77 terawatts to support a global population of 9.5 billion in 2050. And uh, that's, that's remarkable. So what we're talking about here when we're talking about oil or energy, we can talk in, in a way about Promethean revolutions, right? We all remember the story, great story about Prometheus who stole fire from the gods and brought it down to earth and, and gave it to us poor suffering mortals and then off we went and, uh, and ever since then we've, we've tried <laughs> to live and behave like all of those gods in Mount Olympus. And um, so, but this first revolution of, of fire was, was phenomenal. Um, and really transformed the landscape in many sense. Uh, when when we're, you know, we, we use this fire quite often uh, to uh, cut down forests of one kind or another to provide heat sources, and in the process completely transformed Europe, uh, almost deforested the place, uh, such that we were forced in the 17th century to start going underground looking for uh, a heat source, and that began the whole industrial revolution. And the age of coal is not over. We are still using coal all the time. Now, another source of energy that we don't like to talk too much about um, has been slaves. And I want to ask you for a moment not to think of slavery in racial terms, certainly because the Romans did not think this way, uh, nor did the Egyptians, nor, nor did most ancient cultures. They, anybody could be enslaved, all right? It wasn't a white or black thing. It was, we don't care whether you're yellow, green, white, or black. If we've got you and you're in within our power and command, you will do our work. And so for much of human history, uh, we have turned to slavery as an energy institution as a way to get work done. So usually a very small amount of people could accumulate enormous amounts of wealth. And this model is of, of energy is very much one that is still with us today. In fact, what I would suggest is that slavery has very much shaped the way we use energy. Now let me explain. Let's talk a bit about um, our ancient Rome because it was a culture that was primarily, or society or an empire, largely based on the institution of slavery uh, as an energy source. And it worked basically like this. Uh, um, you know, you would send out the army to capture slaves, in some cases at the end of some wars, 70,000 to 100,000 individuals would be sent back to Rome, they would then be sold, the profits would be made, and then they would be put on agricultural estates uh, to grow crops and make more money for the Roman Empire. And um, the, the position of the slave in Roman life and I, it was, was quite remarkable. By the way, throughout almost every culture, again, whether we're, again, talking about Egyptians or, or, or even aboriginals in North America, the whole idea of slavery has always been a form of social death. Once you become the property of somebody else, you are no longer a person. 
You are an inanimate object. You are a tool. Um, and that is how the Romans and the Greeks referred to slaves. They were tools. They were, in, as the Romans put it, talking instruments. And the Romans used slaves not just primarily in agriculture, and they used them in agriculture to boost the energy from agriculture. Agriculture is, was a huge transition, the whole idea of marshalling crops and sunshine to produce concentrated amounts of calories was another Promethean revolution, so to speak. Using slaves to do that even made it much more powerful. So the Romans used slaves to boost their agricultural production and wealth, but they also used slaves to, uh, uh, to take care of them. I mean, they had slaves to change their clothes, they had slaves to cook their meals, they had slaves to change, uh, 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 to take care of the, the fuel in their homes, they had slaves that carried messages, they had slaves that were doctors, they had slaves that were teachers, they had uh, uh, one position of, of a slave in Rome was simply that almost like it was like having a GPS unit or an iPod with you. Uh, the job of this slave was to remember the names of everyone that you met in the streets of Rome. Um, and so you had this incredible refinement of, 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 of activities. So instruments, human instruments being used to provide energy of various kinds. Um, and, and, and in all aspects of life. And these slaves were coming from the Mediterranean, they were coming from Northern Europe. In some cases, these slaves were very uncooperative, such as the, the Celts from, from England. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the whole thing gathered its, it, its own momentum. You send out the troops, you, they come back with the slaves, you sell the slaves, and, and, and this system has this sudden um, slave boom or energy boom and, and a great boost to, to the economy. Um, but it was not sustainable. Now here's Pliny um, the Elder sort of talking about it. He says, we use other people's feet when we go out. We use other people's eyes to recognize things. We use another person's memory to greet people. We use something else's uh, help to stay alive. The only things we keep for ourselves are our own pleasures. And not only that, I mean the Romans abused their slaves horribly. I mean, they sexually abused them, physically abused them. Um, and in some cases, slaves could, could buy their freedom after serving 20, 30, uh, or not, not that long, but 15, 20 years. Um, so it was a very complicated arrangement, but it was nonetheless an energy arrangement. And so you know, a, a, an important function of this, this whole energy arrangement was the Roman army. It's kind of like the oil and gas companies today. Your job is to find and explore. <laughs> Here's the exploration company. You go out and you find me some good slaves in Northern Africa or Northern Europe or, you know, in Turkey or wherever and bring them back. And on this basis, the empire kept expanding because it would ex was expropriating the human energy in other communities. And then it met its limits. And the empire stopped expanding. The army got too big to support. Taxes became overwhelming. And the whole enterprise started to fall apart. Occasionally, you would have energy shocks, you know, where the slaves would, uh, and there weren't very many of these rebellions, but, you know, Spartacus being a good example. But this would be like an oil price shock in the 1970s, right? Everybody in Rome was upset. They were thinking, oh my God, what are these guys in Sicily up to? What are these guys in, in, the, in the middle of Italy up to? We've got to stop this immediately. So they were one army and then another army and then another army to shut this down and to get to restore stability to their energy system. Extraordinary, but that's, that's exactly what it was all about. What is really extraordinary too were uh, how few slave rebellions there actually were. And that's one of the reasons, you know, crucifixion. Now, slavery didn't die out with the collapse of Rome, but it did sort of dissipate and disintegrate as medieval Europe experimented with other forms of energy um, and learned once again the value 
of human labor. I mean, one of the great experiences of Rome and slavery was that everybody learned to detest hard work, right? Because hard work was associated with the state of social death, of being a talking instrument and being the property of somebody else. And one of the, the remarkable things about uh, the Middle Ages was that sort of disappeared because slavery was, was in, in many parts of Europe gone and the whole idea that your work was yours and valuable to you and your community gained some grace. Now, of course, the Europeans were, you know, uh, uh, growing and expanding and, and we come across the Industrial Revolution, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute, and, and then we, we find that the slave trade comes back. Um, and by the way, it came back during World War II. The Japanese uh, had extraordinary armies of slaves in China. The Russians had extraordinary armies of slaves in Eastern Europe. So whenever countries get very low on energy and are desperate, they will enslave other people and use them. And um, so the case with North America was, you know, the Europeans arrived, they killed everyone off with diseases, and uh, the place had no labor. What was the solution? We'll go to Africa, we'll find some energy there. And this enormous, incredible slave trade um, grew up and um, uh, was an absolutely horrific affair. And then you have the abolition movement. Now, the abolition movement occurred almost at exactly the same time that the steam engine was being developed. So in 1780, you have James Watt, this brilliant Scottish guy, fooling around and figured out, came up with a machine that was more efficient at pumping water out of coal mines so that you could mine more coal. And then it was applied and used in, in other industries, many of which associated with slavery, such as the cotton industry and so on, and grew and grew and grew. Now, this was a, an amazing event, actually, that we don't think enough about. Um, the horsepower of these engines was extraordinary. All right, An amazing amount of work. So by 1824, England's steam engines puffed out 26,000 uh, horsepower, the equivalent of nearly 750,000 men or 100,000 horses. And by 1880, steam engines had added 3 billion inanimate slaves, mechanical slaves, to the global economy, particularly in England and, and, and in Europe. So, steam engine, 1780, when does the abolition movement begin? About five or six years later with this guy, Thomas Clarkson. And what, is Tom, what, and what is Thomas Clarkson called by Samuel Coleridge, poet? This man is a moral steam engine. And he led the fight against, uh, against slavery. So you see, at the same time that we began to use fossil fuels, we created armies of mechanical slaves that actually made the, the whole idea of abolition economically and politically uh, prudent thing to pursue. We could afford it. We can do this. We've got these other guys powered by fossil fuels that we can use. Now, Thomas Clarkson was, was, a, he was an extraordinary individual, and he, he, he um, conducted this, this amazing campaign, and he used uh, printing presses run by steam, um, and uh, uh, he used Images, uh, incredibly, that image of the slave ship he was handing around. So he was using all the visual evidence of the horrors of the slave trade to convince people, look, this is time to end this. This is, this is a horrible business. Um, and this is one of the uh, beautiful cameo that was produced by the Wedgwood uh, Company in England. Um, Am I not a man and a brother? And people would wear these pins. And so you see with the beginning of the abolition movement, at the same time that we have more and more energy available in Europe coming from coal and, and being converted in steam engines, that we begin to see all of these social and political movements, followed by the women's movement, followed by the civil rights movement, followed by the, the labor movement, followed by uh, uh, freeing children from, 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 from labor. So you have this explosion this almost social revolution taking place that was very much a product 
of having much more energy on the loose that elites could not control. Now, in the United States, you had, of course, you know, um, a huge energy institution in, in the South. And what was extraordinary about uh, slavery in the South was that the majority of slaveholders were not uh, rich people. They, you know, they, were, they didn't have these huge plantations. They were uh, middle class folks who might have four or five slaves who would use these slaves to create an, an economic surplus for them so that they could rise up the social ladder. And so they were using slaves the same way we might use a car or the same way we might use some other fossil fueled appliance to get where we want to go, to do what we want to do. And, uh, uh, but the, this whole system created a very complex society in, in, in the southern United States. At the same time in the north, uh, where you had totally different energy tradition that was getting hooked on coal and fossil fuels, and you had this intractable uh, war then between a slave-powered society and a cold-fired society that was one of the most bloody conflicts in, in North American history. Um, and, and, and one of the things that this illustrates is that once you get hooked on an energy system, it sets up its own complex arrangements. And this is Joseph Tainter, great anthropologist in the United States. And so the more complex it becomes, the more difficult it becomes to solve problems. And so one of the great difficulties for the South was, how do we uncouple all of this? How do we become something other than what we are? This was the form of energy that we are used to. We've been using it for 300 years, for heaven's sakes. How, how do we change? How do we do something different? And uh, it's one of the reasons you had this, this bloody, bloody conflict. All right. Now let's talk a bit about the United States, because uh, the United States has kind of set the pattern for all of us. It was the world's oil pioneer. And so oil was, was actually, it wasn't really discovered in the United States. I mean, you can go to Russia and you can find places in, in, uh, in, 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 in Russia where oil had been used uh, for a long, long time for, for a variety of purposes. But let's, let's go with the American myth and say for all intents and purposes, oil was discovered in Pennsylvania in uh, 1859, a year before the Civil War erupts and changes the, the course of American history. And so what is oil being used for? Well, it, at this point, it would be distilled and it was used as kerosene, so it was used solely as a form of illumination. And it was competing with a variety of other forms of illumination, whether it be candles, uh, whether it be whale oil, or camphor, or, or, or uh, oils derived from, uh, from, from trees. And, uh, but it had a boost. And the boost was this, that after the Civil War, the US government put a tax uh, on all of the other oils to recoup some of the losses from the war, except for kerosene. So whenever the oil and gas industry says, you know, we've never ever had any advantages of what kind or whatever, here we find that the oil and gas industry right at, at its beginnings has a subsidy that allows it to penetrate the market in, in, in phenomenal ways. So the first developments look like this in Pennsylvania. By the way, Pennsylvania is now going through another oil and gas boom, and that's the shale revolution on so really drawing uh, natural gas from some of the very uh, same reserves that uh, oil was pulled out of the ground. And this boom was one of the greatest things that had happened in the United States since the California Gold Rush. It was that powerful. Everybody was heading to Pennsylvania to make their share, to take part in this boom, and to make a fortune. And of course, one of the guys that got there was John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, uh, a very uh, uh, excellent bookkeeper uh, and, and a visionary in many ways. And he set up a company that essentially became the model for American uh, corporations. Highly secretive, well organized, highly disciplined, everything will be standardized. Um, that was Standard Oil. That became the model for Walmart. It became the model for every big box corporation you can think of. 
and John Dee set the tone for all of it. And all right, so you have to find another market for, for oil. Uh, I mean, distilling it and throwing the gasoline into rivers <laughs> and uh, uh, just wasn't, wasn't one very uh, prudent use of the resource. And so along comes another use, all right, Henry Ford. And this is around 1906, 1907, and uh, another remarkable kind of revolution. Now, they, Henry Ford was a bastard. He was a terrible man in many respects. But you know what? He never thought... Um, his original idea, and, and, and diesel, the, the, the uh, Rudolf Diesel, the, the German inventor of the diesel engine, which actually was, was two to three uh, uh, decades prior to Henry Ford's invention, we, he wanted to run his, uh, on, on vegetable oils. Henry Ford thought the same thing. Why don't we go on with biofuels? He didn't really uh, like the oil industry all that much. But anyway, he, he found for the oil industry another market, and that was gasoline. And this then became one of the most incredible adventures in American life, where you had growth in car sales of 40% a year, just extraordinary. And uh, you know the favorite pastime of every American soon became, even before World War I, was going joyriding on a Sunday afternoon. And you might not, not, might not be far, but that was the idea, the thing to do. And so then you have these progressive booms throughout the United States as oil is found in other regions. And so you move from Pennsylvania, and then you go to Texas, and then you go to Oklahoma, and then you go to California. And these states were the Middle East of their day. They were the world's primary number one oil producers. And in many ways, they behaved just like Middle East states. I mean, with incredibly complex governments, incredibly corrupt in many cases, with long political rules, crazy outrageous politics. Uh, just take a look at Louisiana and the whole uh, Huey Long experience. At unbelievable stuff. This is, by the way, is Huntington Beach in Southern California. <laughs> and one of the remarkable things about oil, early oil development is look how close all those derricks are to each other. And then in the 1930s, uh, you had a, a huge crisis. Um, more large fields of oil were found in Texas, which dropped the price of oil down to 10 cents. It had already been selling for about a buck, a buck and a half. Went down to 10 cents a gallon. And this was a crisis for the industry. It was a crisis for the government. And so everyone got together and said, what are we going to do about this? And they eventually came up with a program um, that became a model for OPEC in the 1970s where you would control the prices to control production so we don't flood the market and destroy ourselves in the process. Along comes World War, World War II. Um, the United States is the dominant oil provider for the entire oil, for the entire war. The war is, is, is basically run on oil and oil-fed machines. And both the Germans and the Japanese lost. Um, and by the way, they both had ambitions to be like the United States. They lost because they did not have the oil sources that the United States did. I mean, the Japanese were sending out kamikaze pilots, not because they had some kind of death wish, but because that was the most prudent way to use their remaining oil resources was a one-way ticket. And the Germans were experimenting with all kinds of synthetic fuels because they'd run out of oil too. And at the end of the war, they talked to all the, they lied, you know, they had interviews. The American intelligence had interviews with German officers and they said, well, why did you lose? You bombed the hell out of our synthetic fuel oil facilities and we ran out of oil. Amazing. This plane, by the way, this is a B-17 flying fortress. Incredible uh, power. Uh, of, of destruction, used more energy than the entire society of Europe did in the Stone Age. Okay? So you can see the evolution of power at work here. Then after the war, all right, so we've destroyed Europe with oil or about oil. How do we rebuild Europe? Well, we'll rebuild it with oil. And one of the reasons we'll do that is because most of the unions producing coal in Europe are controlled by 
communist labor groups. So the Marshall Plan, which was nearly $20 billion exercise, used oil from American companies that were developing the Middle East to rebuild Europe and to get Europe basically hooked on oil. Until that time, Europe uh, was still primarily hooked on coal. And, and, and it worked. Europe then had this exponential growth, and, and um, the Americans also you know, were investing in cars and putting cars on the road. Amazing. And then the next big adventure in the United States was, of course, was, okay, uh, Eisenhower, after touring Germany and seeing the remarkable autobahns that Hitler had all planned, and uh, uh, he thought, well, why don't we do that in the United States? So we built a $27 billion interstate highway to accommodate these mechanical energy slaves on four wheels and, again, changing American life in ways that nobody ever imagined. So you see the machine getting more complicated, more energy being spent, more energy going to more and more inanimate and mechanical slaves. We have the invention of suburbia uh, so that you, can, you don't have to live in these crowded, congested cities anymore with no public transportation because GM and DuPont have worked, uh, collaborated together to remove all the electric trolleys and trains from, from American cities so that they could sell more cars and more buses. Um, there was a, even a congressional committee investigating this. Um, they were fined, I think, a dollar. You know. But that, that's what happened to so many public transport systems in the United States. Then you have the suburbia, you know, which some people have described as, as perhaps one of the, America's greatest uh, and most extraordinary mistakes, particularly when you look at the state of suburbia in the United States today. Um, and then you have this guy. Admiral Rickover is the father of the nuclear submarine, uh, served the Republic for nearly 60 years. A remarkable man, very short, very disciplined. He kind of was the epitome of, 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 of you know, that very competent, very uh, courageous, smart American that we have in our minds. And he gave this most remarkable speech. And he said, and this was to a group of doctors in Michigan, I think in 1956, and he said, you know what? We, we are living like slaveholders. We are living like kings and queens who had all of these, these slaves, but we have all of our mechanical energy slaves. And we're, we don't appreciate what we have achieved here. And the day will come when the fossil fuels needed to keep these slaves running is going to get more expensive and extreme, and we have not prepared for that. And he was concerned about how America's growing dependence on mechanical slaves had undermined the American character. And, and here's a, another thought. I mean, there are two uh, brilliant uh, 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 Texas historians whose name escapes me at the moment who have written an enormous amount about the oil patch in Texas. One of their most salient observations that absolutely stunned me when they talked about oil and its development in the United States and its impact on the culture of American people was, was this. They said, you know, in the 19th century, about 70 to 80 percent of all American males were self-employed. In most cases, they lived on a farm or they were involved in some sort of trade. And then after the introduction of oil, we have this massive change where the majority of American males are working for corporations or are working alongside mechanical slaves. And they said one of the, the, the reasons that oil has such a mixed reception to this day in the United States is because it fundamentally changed the American conception of what, what is it to be a man. And I, I thought that was an extraordinary observation. So Rick Hoover was sort of saying, you know what? Oil has changed us. We are no longer Thomas Jefferson's country. We are a different place. And we need to smarten up here. We need to use less. We need to educate our people better. We need to introduce more taxes so that we can begin and prepare for a transition and do things differently. 
Now, here's some of his comments. Today, the automobile is the most uneconomical user of energy. Its efficiency is 5% compared with 23% for the diesel electric railway. It is the most ravenous devourer of fossil fuels, accounting for over half of the total oil consumption in this country. So here's one of the most marvelous sources of energy in the world, and we're blowing it out the end of a vehicle. We are no longer as independent of men and of government as were Americans two or three generations ago. An even larger share of what we earn must go to solve problems caused by crowded living, bigger governments, bigger cities, state, and federal budgets to pay for more public services. So here he's saying something that the Tea Party and the Libertarians miss every time, that high energy societies, societies that consume vast amounts of energy are automatically going to bloat all of their political, social, and economic institutions because somebody has to keep track of all that energy on the loose because it's changing so many things so quickly and so fundamentally. So it, that was one of the greatest energy speeches ever given in the United States, and most Americans have not read it, have not heard about it, do not know a thing about Rick Hover's speech to the physicians in Michigan in 1956. So, and I'm going to end here, so here was the, the American story. It got hooked on oil. It used oil to create, in some ways, its big government, its big scientific institutions. It used all the surplus from oil to, to, to build its interstate highways, to even invest in some nuclear, the space program, and on it went. So the American character was fundamentally shape oil, and then if, when you look at this graph here, this is kind of... You see the price of oil, all right? So when all of this was going on, the price of oil hardly stayed in, stayed in the same place, basically. And then we hit the 1970s with the first oil shock, and then right up to today, 2008, with the, uh, and, and, and other oil shocks in between, and we see something fundamentally has changed in the United States. In the 1970s, people started paying more for energy. The cheap oil era already ended, and Americans had blasted their way through domestic supplies and were now dependent on foreign supplies of oil. All right, so a few comments about this. All right, here's Bucky Full, Full, uh, um, uh, Fullmeister, um, it, crazy, wacky American scientist, the guy, you know, the guy who invented the geodesic dome. And he made some calculations and he said, okay, in 1810, there were about one million families in the United States and if you were you know, to do the calculations with, with, with slavery in the states at that time, that meant that every family on average had one slave. He said, that, that's pretty incredible. And then, all right, we go through, we blast through our way, a whole bunch of coal, and then we get into oil, uh, really big in the 1920s, and we, the average American now has at their disposal 39 energy slaves. And he's saying, that's pretty damn remarkable. That's a huge fundamental change in the scheme of things. So he published this map in a Fortune magazine, no less, and he has red dots and white dots, and the red dots tell you how many inanimate slaves might be located there, being powered by fossil fuels or by electricity, um, and, 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 and where the, the people lived. And you know, he came up with these incredible calculations that there were something like 368 billion inanimate energy slaves on the planet serving um, you know, about 2 billion people. So let's do some, some calculations here. Every barrel of oil has got about 6 billion joules. Um, so what is that? Well, 360,000 joules an hour, that's a slave for 8.6 years. So one barrel of oil is equivalent to having a, a, a slave uh, working away at you at 8.6 years, with some holidays and some breaks on the weekend, by the way. And so the average North American consumes about 24 barrels of oil, or oil equivalent a year, and that equals to 206 slaves per person. A North American family then has commands more than about 1,000 inanimate slaves, and a nation of 300 million then controls 500 billion energy slaves. Now, how complicated can that get? Pretty damn complicated. And what are we? 
These slaves are, you know, 50 million land mower, uh, 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 mowers, uh, 6 million motorcycles, 13 million boats, 250 million vehicles. You know, it, Vaclav Schmil, the great Canadian uh, energy economist at University of Manitoba, he said, you know, if a Martian came to, the, to this planet, he'd say, you know, machines run everything. What do you guys do? You know? And the relationship our energy relationship with slavery, you can then see being reflected in our use of these mechanical inanimate slaves. All right, this is a, a 1932 vehicle, and what is it called? It's called the Master Deluxe. Yeah. And then you look, you know, you look in Brazil in the 19th century and, and their uh, use of slaves. Um, a wonderful Brazilian historian, Gilberto, Gilberto Freira, uh, wrote three marvelous books about slavery in Brazil that are uh, um, uh, very colorful books. And one of the things he writes about, one of the books is called The Mansions and the Shanties, and he talks about the slaveholders, and they have these big friggin' houses, right? Because you're a slaveholder, you've got all this energy to your command, maybe at 30, 40 slaves, you know, growing sugar or coffee or whatever it is, chocolate, and, and uh, you got to show off, and you have your big house. And no different than the McMansions that we have today. Uh, we fill it with mechanical slaves. And one of the th things about this kind of culture is its indebtedness. The most fundamental thing about 19th century slaveholders in Brazil, I don't know if this is true in, in, in the American South, I suspect it was, was how in debt everybody was. You know, everybody owed money because you wanted to buy more slaves to produce more goods so that you have more surplus energy so that you could add another wing to your house or whatever. And so here's Dave Graeber who wrote a, a great book called Debt saying, you know, if Aristotle were magically transported to the U.S., he would conclude that most of the American population is enslaved because for him the distinction between selling yourself and renting yourself is at best a legalism. We've managed to take a situation which most people in the ancient world would have recognized as a form of slavery and turned it into the definition of freedom. And here's one of the great, the great things in almost every uh, ancient society, if you got into debt, you could sell yourself as a slave to get out. Now, so we have this, this great, incredible oil-fired country called the United States exploding, exuberant on all this, this energy. Um, and then we, we, we see this kind of ripple effect right across the globe as more and more cultures are adopting oil and employing mechanical slaves. Now, I know that you had a speaker in this series talk about farming, so I'm not going to say much about it or the use of land. And, and uh, uh, I take it he said some rather in, uh, um, uh, interesting things about uh, GMOs. But here's the, the big thing that, that oil really did. Um, is that you know in the 19th century, 70% of the population in North America worked on farms, and they were primary energy providers. Right? This was they were not only just growing calories, but providing energy for the economy. Oils changed that. I think less than one percent of the population today is employed in farming. Whoa! I mean, that's almost unbelievable. I mean. And one of the reasons for this is a fellow by the name of Fritz Haber, won't say too much about him, a rather brilliant German a Jewish scientist who at uh, the advent of World War I uh, developed a process for uh, taking nitrogen out of the air and turning it into ammonia and using it as a fertilizer. And of course, it also makes very good explosives. And so uh, Fritz Haber was probably one of the guys responsible with the Haber-Bosch process for extending the life of World War I because it was never used uh, for food supply or for improving sp sp food supplies, but it was used for the production of, of uh, munitions. But this ability to have fertilizer and replenish soil that has been mined uh, over a long period of time really set about detonated uh, you know, human population. And so about 2% of all natural gas supplies are now used to create this fertilizer, ammonia. The other big thing in, in agriculture, so that was one huge uh, fossil fuel transformation, was this guy, Norman Borlong, 
American scientist funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, no less, um, who came up with uh, uh, high yielding grains that required lots of fertilizer, lots of water, lots of pesticides, and so on. And this sort of became the, the industrial standard model for industrial food production uh, around the planet and made it possible for human populations to grow the way they have. And then you see your typical monoculture with wheat. And here you see uh, a monoculture uh, run by slaves in, uh, in British Guiana in South America. And don't ever get this idea that the Russians were somehow different and wanted to go off and do something uh, extraordinary. They had exactly the same ideas about uh, using energy to modify, dramatically change the, the landscape for their own purposes. And of course, I mean, you can't go to the United States without seeing the consequences of an industrial food system that is concentrating certain kinds of fats and sugars is this proliferation of not just fat Americans, but fat Canadians, fat everybody. Uh, any culture that has adopted this model has changed its metabolism. Now, all right, so we have this population explosion that oil has played a very dramatic role in, largely because of the way it transformed farming. I'm not going to say much about this. You know, here you can see when the first oil was drilled, you can see where we went, I mean, oil has basically been the Viagra of the species. And, uh, you know, and the problem is, you know, we've run out of the cheap stuff. So what are we going to do now that we've got 7 billion people on the planet? We've created this incredibly complex network, all based on, on the use of oil, coal, or natural gas. How are we going to change that? Well, it's not going to happen quickly. Now, the other thing I, I just want to say, and, and there's much I could say about how oil has changed us, Demographically, I mean, the, 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 uh, it has made it possible for us to live longer. Actually, one of the most remarkable things about John D. Rockefeller, you know, one of the most wealthiest men in the United States, his primary goal was li to live to the age of 100. He was seeking immortality. And so one of the consequences of, of, of high energy usage is that we've been able to extend our life um, so to, to, to the fact that, you know, the growest, fastest growing population in Japan are 80 year olds, right? Now, unfortunately though, I mean, one of the consequences of, of, of being, having this master resource and using it so masterfully to master our landscape and master our environment is that, you know, around 1970, we kind of blew our way out of things and now we really need two planets to handle our demands on resources. Another thing that changed has been the growth of, of, of cities, of megacities, and uh, a phenomenal change. Again, 19th century, everyone lived in the country. And that more than 60% of the population, world's population, now lives in big cities. We're not talking about little cities, we're talking about cities with 15, 20, 25 million people. All right, this has never happened before on the planet. We have never seen this. And not only that, these cities are energy hogs. All right, we're talking 67% of the world's oil is used in cities. The figure for coal is even higher. And so we, we've created these, these entirely new living arrangements. And their footprints are remarkable. Here's Berlin, and you can see its ecological footprint is, <laughs> you know, about half the size of Germany, for God's sake. The ecological footprint of London uh, one of the world's first megacities, and it's no accident that, you know, that was a product of the coal and industrial revolution. It, you know, takes up most of England. Here's an example of, of a, a really toxic megacity, and I would say they're all uh, unsustainable. Houston, you know, a great oil town uh, built on a savanna of oak trees and, and grasses and swamps. And... Um, and here you see what we do with our oil, you know, all these standard uh, kind of rearrangement of the landscape. And, and then we've got this marvelous architect, uh, Lars Larup, who has spent many years in Houston. He says, let me make a note about the last part of the subtitle here. He says, suburban cities dominated by the single family house and an alphabet of supporting solitaries of shopping centers, high schools, and gas stations. 
are proliferating at a dizzying rate all over the world. Much like franchise fast food chains and hotels, these generic suburban cities look alike and function pretty much the same way, um, suggesting that they form one giant megacity no longer just attached to existing older cities, but spread to form an autonomous urbanization operating globally. Conceptually, like the largest living organism, the Oregon fungus, which although tattered, sprawls over thousands of acres, urban sprawl is no longer just a nuisance, but an empire. And it's powered by oil. And he, then he, he goes through the scenario, of what would happen if you have this extreme weather event hit Houston, and, and they do on a regular basis, and where you have, and it would go like this, you have an extreme ozone alert, which they have quite often in Houston, and you know everyone is confined indoors, and then you have this 500-year hurricane that comes and drops on the city, and then you have you know, weeks of, of severe flooding, and, and, and all of these man-made um, uh, uh, systems are, 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 you know, become uh, couriers for water, and then you followed by blackouts, and, and on it goes. And, and what Larup is basically saying is that these megacities mega are going to find their own limits, and these limits will be imposed by Mother Nature. And as in our Aboriginal past, we must again give room to our oceans, rivers, and deltas. Now, I, I'm going to skip the big science, so I don't run out of time here. Um, economic thinking. So oil did change our... Uh, are, and coal, the two of them together, created such enormous surpluses of wealth that we created this big science enterprise, and I'll just leave it at that. And so we have big science, and then we have scientists coming in the 1960s and 1970s saying, whoa, where are we going with all this? We seem to be, everything seems to be oriented towards, you know, uh, uh, consumption of one thing or another, and, and everything is getting bigger, and whatever happened to the whole idea of little science? And so you have this whole concept of big science and little science, just like big companies and small companies and big governments and small governments. And But high energy consumption changes the metabolism of everything and, of course, makes it big. But now, economic thinking, well, it used to be that economic thinking was basically about peasants and crops and sun or slaves, and, and it was about stuff, real physical stuff, and how it all works and how you get the surplus out of it. Um, and, uh, and then that kind of changed with the Industrial Revolution. We have Adam Smith, who is really a, a very brilliant, another brilliant Scottish guy. And when is he writing? Well, he's writing in the middle of a coal boom in Scotland. And he's saying, wow, this is amazing. We have all this, it doesn't say it in these terms, but he said, you know, there's all this energy on the loose creating all of this wealth. And, he's, and so he writes this book about wealth. And he says, you know, you know what is it all about? It's, well, you know, it, it's about money. It's about getting wealthy. It's, this is what the purpose of economics seems to be. And he was a much smarter guy than that. He understood that you can't be wealthy without spending important resources and stuff. And then you have a whole proliferation of, of, of economists all sort of fixating on the idea of wealth, all being about you know, uh, labor and capital, and, uh, and that energy is not involved in the process at all. You know? And one of the, the guys is a, 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 um, Irving Fisher, an American economist, one of the most popular economists in the United States at the turn of the century. Again, really incredible guy, quite eccentric. Um, um, believed that the unfit or the unproductive should be euthanized, as did many people in the, at that time, and uh, and was uh, one of these uh, was a vegetarian and, and everything else. And he said, you know, capitalism is really the it's the science of wealth, and he wanted to master the mathematics of. Of, of this wealth, even had this little nifty little machine, you know, that, that if you pulled the right levers and stuff, it would tell you where all the money's gonna going, you know, press stopper one and raise number three, Red Fisher's instructions, uh, one, two, and three now represent a wealthy middle class and the poor man respectively, you know, this kind of mathematical idea that you can somehow, you know, predict everything that's gonna happen in, in economics. And then he's followed by people like Robert Solo and Paul Samuelson and, you know, and Samuelson is saying that, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's all about the technology and it's about capital and labor and, and how we employ it. And, and, and I, I could go on for days talking about the economists. But there were other voices out there that are saying, wait a moment, guys, you got it all wrong. Economics is about 
the spending of energy. Wealth is a flow of energy, period. Stop the flow of energy and your wealth will decline or diminish or disappear. Frederick Soddy, who won the Nobel Prize for his research on uh, uh, radioactive isotopes, got so upset with the way the economic profession was going was that he stopped his science and he spent the last 30 years of his life writing about economists and how crazy they were and how unscientific they were. And he said, look, if the supply of energy fails, modern civilization would come to an end as abruptly as the music of an organ deprived of wind. Wealth is a flow and it cannot be saved. And then, you know, so we have this traditional idea of economics is the study of how people transform nature. Um, well, this is, this is really what economics is. It's the study of how people transform nature to meet their needs. And, uh, uh, and we have forgotten that. And most economic thinking is, it, I mean, it's not scientific. It cannot, it, it is not predicting anything. And uh, the majority of it, whether it's coming from a, a leftist or coming from a right winger or a libertarian, is complete and total bullshit. Um, the Irving, um, you know, famously said, and he was a Yale economist, one of the, you know, tradition of Yale economists, 1929, he said, this is a sustained boom, invest in the stock market. You know, a week later, <laughs> he lost his fortune. And yet, here was the expert telling people what to do. Now, oil also has, has changed the character of states. And the instrument that has been used to change these states have been oil companies. ExxonMobil, which is a descendant, by the way, of Standard Oil, is one of the world's largest corporations, right? Makes, on average, nearly half a billion, uh, nearly $500 billion a year in, in revenue. You know, outclasses you know, hundreds and hundreds of countries. PetroChina is one of the big ones. Sinopec, world's seventh largest company. These are all oil companies. The amazing thing about this is that in the United States, in the oil and gas industry, fewer than one million people are providing the energy for the rest. And this is a very privileged, very elite group of, of people that work in the patch. This is also a very highly subsidized industry, $700 billion a year goes to these companies. And that's from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Now, petrostates are states that get hooked on fossil fuels. The United States was one of the first. It got hooked on fossil fuels and got really hooked on cheap oil. And to this day remains, I would say, it, it has now entered the phase of almost a failing or dysfunctional petrostate. So what is it about petrostates? They rely on unsustainable development trajectory fueled by an exhaustible resource, and the very returns produced by this resource form an implacable barrier to change. And they do several things. They lower taxes, they overspend, they concentrate power, and they're largely incompetent. Right? They've got so much money. They figure money will solve any and every problem. They lose the ability of statecraft. What is statecraft about? Statecraft is created by dealing with scarcity, not with abundance. And then when, you have, when, 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 when your taxes are being paid by oil companies, you change the political relationship of your citizens. When taxation is absent, populations tend to be politically inactive, relatively obedient, surprisingly loyal. We have this experience in Alberta, you know, with King Ralph. Venezuelans have this experience with Hugo Chavez. They have a charming Sarah Palin in Alaska. Uh, this nasty guy, uh, this guy in Russia, another example of, of a, your petro politician using oil revenue to direct the state in certain directions. Another classic petro politician, uh, George W. Bush. By the way, Four presidents of the United States have come from Texas. We have our own petropolitician right now in Ottawa, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. People seem to forget that she funded her political revolution with oil from the North, with revenue from oil from the North Sea. Not a dime was saved, by the way. 
So you have high levels of dependence on oil rents have always tended to reinforce the regime in power. So in Mexico, you had a party ruling Mexico on the basis of oil money for 70 years. In Alberta, we've been a one-party state for 41 years. Actually, it'll be 45 now. Uh, Texas was ruled by the Democrats for 90 years in a row. Didn't change until Karl Rove came along in the 1980s. And uh, now the Republicans have ruled that state for nearly 30 years. Um, oil money has funded extremists of every kind. Eugene McCarthy, uh, not Eugene McCarthy, but Joe McCarthy, the communist witch hunter, was largely funded by the big rich in Texas. In fact, he was known as the third senator from Texas. And they actually hated him because he was such a bore and such an alcoholic, he'd come into their homes and, and uh, uh, they ha would have to kick him out. Uh, you have the Koch brothers in the United States who have funded the Tea Party movement. Um, you have this group, the Cornwall Alliance, which is uh, an evangelical Protestant organization, organization that is very pro-fossil fuels and that considers environmentalists to be the devil and satanic. One of the greatest threats to society and the church today is the multifaceted environmentalist movement. Now, I'm going to skip this and get right to the end here. So where are we going? The good news here is that we've been blown our way through this incredible legacy of energy, 24 barrels a year, and most of that is being wasted on, on useless and idiotic stuff. And, uh, and the good news is that we could be quite happy with seven barrels or less. And in fact, most people are. And in fact, you reach a certain saturation point, and in fact, the Americans for all their oil consumption have uh, much worse records than the Europeans when it comes to child mortality, when it comes to education, when it comes to just about every measure of happiness or welfare, the Americans are below the Europeans, or for that matter, below the Japanese who use much less energy. So Black Lives Mill says this too. He says, insofar as political freedoms are concerned, they have little to do with any increases of energy above the existential minima, 1.5 barrels a day. Indeed, some of the world's most repressive societies have high or even very high energy consumption. This guy, this uh, radical uh, Catholic, Ivan Illich, um, put it another way, because he spent much of his time thinking about the fundamental issue, which is how much energy do we really need? What is right for us? He said, even if non-polluting power were feasible and abundant, the use of energy on a massive scale acts on society like a drug that is physically harmless but psychically enslaving. A community can choose between maintaining its addiction to alien energy and kicking it in painful cramps, but no society can have a population that is hooked on progressively larger numbers of energy slaves and whose members are also autonomously active. The more slaves you employ, the less freedom you actually can exercise at the end of the day. And all the great historians about slavery have always focused on the fact of how fundamentally the institution of slavery changed and corrupted the character of the master. So where are we today now? Well, I would say that we are in a very dramatic period where we've run out of the easy oil, we are now into difficult oil, and we are beginning to see our economies respond to this reality. If wealth is the flow of energy, and the flow of energy is becoming constricted and more difficult and more expensive, then we will see contractions and constrictions throughout society and throughout all institutions in society. Now, Fred Cotterill, as an American sociologist, wrote this in 1955. And he talked about high energy societies and low energy societies. And the question was, well, what's going to happen in a transition when you're going from high to back to low energy consumption? He said, the growth of centralized government will stop and wither. Moreover, the energy descent will unleash endemic conflict. Those whose greatest advantage is in the marketplace will struggle to protect it. We will see extreme adventures like this. You know, we're pretending this is business as usual when you are excavating an area the size of Rhode Island 
to produce a junk crude that then has to be refined and processed before you can even make turn it into a synthetic fuel that you can use. You see that you know with the Deep uh, Horizon disaster. I mean, here we are. We're drilling two miles beneath the ocean floor. Incredible exercise in complexity and difficulty. That's telling us, you know what, you're, you're running out of the easy stuff. And so your behaviors are becoming more extreme. Hydraulic fracking, where we are drilling two miles beneath the ground and then horizontally extending for another two miles and then exploding charges to break up rock that is as dense as concrete to release minute amounts of methane that we hope won't contaminate groundwater before it reaches uh, the well bore. Our oil picture is basically we, we're stagnant. We are not producing more oil on the planet right now. We've reached a plateau. We're around somewhere around 80 million barrels and we're not going any higher, but we seem to be having trouble moving off that. We see the level of indebtedness is extraordinary throughout the world, and a lot of this debt is most visible in countries that are oil importers. Japan, the United States. We think that renewables might save the day. All right, this is actually a wind farm very close to my property in southern Alberta, and there's nearly 1,000 frickin' windmills down in this part of southern Alberta right now, placed with all the same sort of attention and care that one uh, designs a, uh, an oil and gas field, and um, uh, extraordinary. And uh, the money for it is coming from California. I'm paying for the transmission, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's an absolute scan. I call it environmental bling, if that's what you would, but it's not making the world greener. It's all done on the wrong scale. If we were to build enough windmills to replace oil in North America, we would need nearly a third of the continent. We would need $15 trillion. We'd need 16 million windmills. And in the process, we would change the entire climate of the North Atlantic and be creating windstorms up there. Gives you an idea of some of the scale issues here that are extremely difficult. Another is the capacity, the constancy of energy. All right, we know that wind is intermittent, right? If it's blowing 25 to 30 percent of the time, photovoltaics are also intermittent. Well, you know, there are other sources of energy, fossil fuels being one of them, that are much more constant. So we have you know, reports coming out saying stuff like this. Governments should begin educating their citizenry of the risk of contraction to minimize potential future social discord. They're saying, you know what? You guys are in debt. You haven't got the money to invest in renewables. If you wanted to do that, you should have started 20 years ago. And we have this complicated structure built around fossil fuels that no more complicated, no more difficult, no more ornery than a slave plantation in the 19th century, and we don't want to let go of it. And in fact, we're, we're making the arguments, hey, we invested in this, why should we let go of it? And we've got these dreams that maybe we can go on an energy diet, which would be a damn good idea. And what happens when we do that? Well, let me give an example of one modern transition. This happened in Cuba, 1991. The Cubans call it the special period. And what happened? Soviet Union collapsed. No more oil for Cuba. And no more food. Majority of its food and the majority of its oil all came from Russia, the mother country. Stopped overnight. It was like a plane crashing in the economy. It was that dramatic. And so you can see this dramatic drop in gross domestic product. You can see this dramatic drop in wages. You had uh, nearly 100,000 people go blind due to malnutrition because the Cuban economy wasn't geared towards local food supply. It was all about you know, exporting sugar or tobacco. And they had to take this very cumbersome communist system of state control of agricultural resources and immediately 
totally hooked on, on fossil fuels and her pesticides and herbicides and completely change it. And, you know, and, and the Cuban government had to rely on a group of people that they uh, uh, had distrusted, which were small peasants and small farmers. And they said, okay, guys, you know, we're going to starve here unless, you know what, you can, you can keep your proceeds. You can keep your profits from your sale. 50% you can keep and so on. And yes, you can have this small farm here and this small farm here. And, and off it went. So the largest organic farming operation in the world began in Cuba not by ideological design, not because Green said it was the thing we have to do, is it because it was the only way the Cubans could respond to this dramatic change in energy flow to the island. And it was an extraordinary experience. To this day, uh, uh, nearly a third to half of the food in Havana is grown by ordinary people and employs thousands of people. Chickens are raised on roofs and the whole nine yards, and they have worms to do the composting, and uh, Cubans are now eating more vegetables than they've ever eaten in their lives. You know, before it was pork and rice and beans. So that's what a transition looks like. It wasn't predictable and it wasn't conflict free. So here's some of the questions I leave with you tonight. Will economic growth as a social glue become undone as the flow of oil decreases and becomes more expensive? What we see in Greece what we see in Spain, what we see um, um, elsewhere in the world, is that going to become the new normal? Here's Joseph Tainter again making a comment. Because of the connection of energy to problem solving, we will not stop using fossil fuels until we are forced to, like the Cubans. Will small replace big? Will we see the breakup of Europe? Well, we, you know, Leopold Kor, great Australia, uh, Austrian economist, put it this way, if a society grows beyond its optimum size, as we have obviously done on oil, its problems must eventually outrun the growth of those human f uh, faculties which are necessarily for dealing with them. Hence, it is always bigness and only bigness which is the problem of existence. The problem is not to grow, but to stop growing. The answer, not union, but division. Will religious values replace rampant materialism? That's our religion. Our religion is consumption, yeah. right? So here we have the Roman experience, some of the most narcissistic materialist culture you can, you can think of, expropriating the surplus energy of human slaves and millions of human slaves, um, squandering it, wasting it, And then the whole thing collapses, and what happens? This is a remarkable story. So here's this guy, St. Benedict, son of a wealthy Roman family, 600 AD, walks away from it all, says, I don't want to be part of this bullshit anymore. And he goes and he starts a religious order in a small town that is completely self-sufficient and that is based on the principle that manual labor is a virtuous, good thing. And not only that, is that you should spend not all of your time doing hard work, but at least half of your time doing artistic things, things that serve God, serve the things, the greater community. So here you have another transition that took place. Um, that began with somebody saying, I don't want to be part of this narrative anymore. Now there's a, a great Catholic theologian, and I have to, you know, my, my Catholic roots here are showing. Um, Alistair McIntyre wrote a great book called After Virtue. So here he says, this is where we're at, he says. This time, however, the barbarians are not waiting beyond the frontiers. They've already been governing us for quite some time. And it is our lack of consciousness of this that constitutes part of our predicament we are waiting not for a Godot, but for another, doubtless, quite different St. Benedict. And I will end there. Thank you. When I wrote this book, uh, and it was an extremely difficult book for me to write, because I found it so discomforting, and because I found it challenged 
of many of my ideas about energy and, and society. And, you know, I've been writing about the oil and gas industry for 20 years. And the industry largely takes the view that, you know, if you ride in a car or take an airplane somewhere, uh, therefore you have given up your right to criticize the oil and gas industry, um, which is pretty much the attitude of many slaveholders in the 19th century. And um, um, although I would say in, in the South the slaveholders were a little more generous, they were actually had great doubts great moral doubts about what they were doing and, 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 and the righteousness and the sinfulness of what they were doing. They actually had those conversations. Um, and, and we are uh, afraid, I think, of, of, of those conversations. But I, I found a great deal of what I have said tonight, and I've given you just a very short version of it, um, unsettling. Because there's something profoundly human about um, wanting to be like a god on Mount Olympus and having all of this energy. You know, you know, all, we we flock to the movies and and you know the the rage at the moment is watching all these superheroes. We have these; they're like Greek gods. I mean, they can throw thunderbolts, they can fly through the air, they can cause earthquakes. You know, they can do all kinds of amazing things. And with lots of energy, that's sort of what we aspire to do and, and be. Another analogy would be, you know, we are, when we come across an amazing source of energy, we're a bit like the fisherman who has come to a, a marvelous river and you come to this pool in the river where there's, you know, 20 massive trout or salmon there. and you go wild, you know, you hit that pool and you, you got to catch those fish, right? And you feel like a kid and you feel giddy because you've collected all of this wealth and energy so quickly and so, so rapidly and you can't believe your good fortune. And, and I think that has been our experience with oil. And it is a very human thing to do. And uh, anyway, but we've got a question. Okay. I, I wonder about uh, one of our most addictive uh, energy slaves seems to be the elevator. I work in a small <laughs> inn, uh, which is three stories, the height of a sort of, it, it meets neighborhood standards here in Halifax. And when I tell people that there's not an elevator, uh, I think, oh my God, because the world is building, in fact, oil states are building higher and higher towers of Babel in a kind of a, you know, um, a penis test. Uh, for each of them, you know, how high can they go? All depend, obviously, on elevators because if you can't climb a, if you can't climb one story, heaven help you when you're trying to climb 120. What's the world going to do with all those buildings once that isn't a priority and food is the priority for our oil? Well, it, it's another illustration of how comfortable we become being served by mechanical slaves and how in question, we, we don't question that. We just we we're enjoying the comfort provided at the moment, and there's no thought about tomorrow. I mean, one of the most remarkable things about 19th century Brazil was the fact that uh, it, it, Brazil was one of the last places in the world where every slaveholder was, was, was carried in, the, in these, these carts by slaves around. And I, there's, a, there's a name for them, and it just escapes me at the moment. But, uh, and so, you, you know, they were reluctant to use horses or carriages or anything else because, well, we've got the, the comfort of slaves here to carry us around. Why should we change? Why should we, uh, you know, uh, do anything else? And it's, it's, it's remarkable how quickly we adapt to these things without thinking, well, what's wrong with walking? You know, that's one of the world's most fundamental freedoms is being able to use our own two legs. But, yeah. Um, first, I would like to thank you very much for your talk tonight. And I'd also like to thank you for your excellent book, Tar Sands. I encourage really everyone to read the book. I think it's one of the most important books for Canadians. Um, to control slaves, uh, historically, you know, violent force was needed. It is no surprising then that the United States has the world's largest military, an instrument of force, and the U.S. military is the largest consumer of fossil fuels. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are um, with 
uh, under the, the Harper government, we're seeing an increase in militarism in Canada, and we're seeing an increased support for the oil and gas sector. So I, I would be interested to hear your links about that, and then also your thoughts on the nationalization efforts that we're seeing in places like Bolivia and Argentina, where the, the governments are saying, you know, we're going to control the oil, and the oil and gas companies or the energy companies. In Canada, we don't, the Canadian people don't even own majority shareholder in any oil and gas company. Norway is one company, is one country that you didn't list in your slides, that uh, the, the people, um, you know, 60% of Stad Oil is, is owned by the people of Norway, and they have a, a surplus of $573 billion. We're in debt in Canada of $583 billion. Okay, let me ask, answer the first question about uh, petrostates and, and the military. Um, there is no doubt that um, oil exporting countries can generate so much cash and so much revenue that uh, the question is, is, you know, what do you do with this? Well, one of the things that they typically do is invest it in, in military prowess and, and shows. So Saudi Arabia spends an enormous amount of its GDP on, on military. Ecuador, when it became an oil power, spent it that way. The, of course, the United States has spent an enormous amount on, on its military. What is one of the first things that Canada does as it becomes a major oil exporter is that we are now spending more on our military than we did after World War II. It's an extraordinary development and change. The Norwegians, by the way, I think are, are among the world's major exporter of, of weapons and munitions. I mean, and so they too have made this, this investment in, in, in the military. So the second part of your question is, all right, um, what about these, these, these examples of other countries in the world uh, where the state is now nationalizing these very uh, lucrative uh, energy plays, uh, such as Argentina, or you could say Russia. I mean, Russia has basically took over the whole damn oil and gas industry, and Putin is using that revenue to, to essentially run the Russian state. Um, uh, Norway is a is a is a really good example, and and and, and you know there are pros and cons to nationalization. Um, the critical thing is that you want to be able to control these players in your country, and you want to secure the very uh, largest share of wealth you can for the owners of the resource and prudently use that money um, not to build military machines, but, uh, but for more nobler things. Um, so the Norwegians, unlike us, had a conversation about their oil wealth, and this is back in the 1970s. And they said, what are we going to do with all this money? And when they realized how rich the North Sea uh, reserves were, um, and they, they decided, well, you know, it was actually worked out to 25 million bucks per Norwegian. All right, there's around 4 million Norwegians. And uh, they said, man, this will destroy us as a country unless we, we, we have a conversation about this. And the Norwegians were also very aware of what had happened in England. They had watched Margaret Thatcher use all of that surplus from the North Sea for her own political ends much as Harper is using the surplus from the oil sands for his own political ends. And they didn't like that. So then the Norwegians had a, had a very lucky moment. They had uh, an Iranian uh, petroleum engineer uh, arrive in Norway who had married a Norwegian wife and they had a child with a disability and had come to Norway to get care for this child. And the Norwegians, uh, you know, they, after two or three days in the country, uh, you know, the country had just knew they had this oil, didn't know what to do with it. Um, they, uh, he applied for a job and he got it immediately. And this guy then really set the tone for the Norwegian experience, having come from uh, Iraq and, and, and seen what had gone on there. And the colonial experience, he said, no, the Norwegians should have a Norwegian experience. We will go slow. We will save the money for future generations, hence the $500 billion fund. And we will do this in a way that is different than other countries. He set up a petroleum um, directorate to, to manage. He had some of the, the toughest environmental legislation and rules of, of the day for, for Norway's North Sea. And so then you, you have the Norwegian experience. It is an isolated experience. Um, almost every other petro state has had a totally different experience with their oil than Norway. And that's because the Norwegians were lucky enough uh, to have 
this, this one petroleum engineer plus determined enough to have their own conversation about what to do about it. I actually have a, a, a question from one of our live stream viewers, right? I'm curious about uh, EROI. Okay. Could you elaborate? All right. The question is about EROI or energy return on energy investment, which I just skipped over. And, um, but it's an important concept and it's really about surplus. All right. When we have a surplus of something, that's when we sort of sit down and play and can have fun. And, and whether it's a surplus of time or a surplus of energy, really works that way for energy. And, uh, and it, is, it is really about what, what, what so much of the oil experience is about. Oil gave us this incredible surplus. Right? You did, didn't have to work very hard and you found this stuff and a remarkable surplus. So the energy return on energy invested, you know, very little energy would, to, to find the oil and then you have this massive surplus. So one barrel of, of oil would find you 100 more or actually at the turn of the century it was around 1,000 more. And so now we're at the point where it takes one barrel of oil to find 20 to 30. In the United States, it's one barrel of oil to, to one on 10. Uh, in the oil sands, it's about one on five for the mining projects and down to you know, uh, one on three or, or one and one and a half for the steam plants. So it's almost equivalent to the energy return from a biofuel or ethanol. Um, and uh, so, and, and renewables also tend to have very low energy returns. A wind, however, is much higher than, than bitumen. Um, you have shell gas has actually got quite, quite high returns, but they seem to drop off. But this is a really important concept that we don't talk about as a people, that our regulators don't talk about, that our economists don't talk about, and that we should be talking about all the time before we approve or, or think about another energy project. Um, hydropower, by the way, has very high energy returns. Uh, we should always be thinking about this idea and this concept. I have, uh, I think I have two questions for you. So my first question is, um, if we don't use oil as a slave anymore to survive as a society, what do you suggest that we use? Because I'm hearing you say that we need to slow down and that we need to be smaller uh, and that we need to use ourselves as resources. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. But my second question stems out of this. Um, I don't necessarily trust humanity to do that. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, as my second question, how you would suggest uh, we as a society work to curb our own need to enslave somebody else to do our work for us, whether that be another human being or just another resource on our planet? Hmm. Well, I think for oil, the question is, right, what, what do we use oil for now? Well, right now it has a monopoly on transportation fuels and transportation. I mean, 90% of the fuels we use to get around are fossil fuels or most particularly oil. And, um, and I think we, we can consciously whittle away at that uh, figure. Um, quite dramatically, and uh, and save oil for other purposes and for other things that we might want to use oil for. So I'm not saying that we should banish oil entirely. I'm saying that we really need to change the way and rethink the way we use oil, and in particular, um, uh, how much we use uh, per person. So, and now we have this difficult concept about, okay, well, we have used other forms of energy to enslave uh, people. And then we have, uh, well, slavery was a pretty good example of an energy institution where we a few people are enslaving others to, to use their surplus. And now we have a case where we're using these, you know, fossil fuels um, to feed these inanimate slaves that quite frankly, have gotten out of control. There are so many of them, and, and, and their interactions have become so complicated um, that they have changed the metabolism of cities, that, at every aspect of our, of our lives. And it's because we, we didn't have this conversation. Uh, and really, it's an ethical question. It's a moral question. How much energy are we entitled to, and, and where is it going to come from? Are we going to live off the natural flows of energy on this planet? Or are we going to continue to dig and mine for uh, ancient sunshine buried in 
in the earth that we can burn? And, uh, uh, or can we find a way to live um, that, is, that is different? And I, you know, and I think we, we forget that we've been there. We have lived differently. We have lived with less energy. And in fact, we've, we've actually been quite happy doing so. Um, I think the really big question is how do we get 7 billion people, or more particularly, how do we get 1 billion people who own and control most of the world's uh, energy production and energy consumption, how do we get those people to live with less um, without causing extreme endemic conflict? And I, I don't know how that's possible. And I, and I think that what we are beginning to see with these economic and political convulsions we are seeing is the system is going to work its way out one way or another. And our ability to consciously control what is going to happen as a society, not as individuals or families, I think we can do much there. We might have given up that opportunity. We probably gave it up 20 years ago. Hello. Um, okay, my question, I'll keep it short, I guess, is what is your um, career advice or just advice in general to young people who are the future inheritors of all these problems? <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, well, my first and foremost would be um, enjoy life. It is a gift and um, laugh, enjoy your friends, eat well. And then my second would be is that uh, um, prepare yourself for a very volatile world. And your best way to do that is to be extremely resilient, is to know how to do many very basic things. So whether you have worked on a farm or whether you've worked in a factory or whether you know how to repair things, um, uh, whether you have a good knowledge of herbs and, and, and uh, you know, make yourself as self-reliant. Um, build the, your community of friends and, and, and relatives that you can, who's, wisdom you can you can draw upon um, you won't have a career um, you <laughs> uh, you don't want to make a career out of this but you uh, you will have a very exciting life and we we do have some brief concluding remarks Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kevin Kindred. I have never worked on a farm or in a factory. I don't know anything about herbs or how to repair things, so my future is bleak. Um, but I am a member of SESEPA's programming committee. Um, we're the ones who sit around the table trying to dream up what topics that people like you might be interested in hearing about and discussing under that general umbrella topic of ethics and public affairs. Uh, and I hope that you agree that we made a good choice tonight. Um, I want to thank Andrew on behalf of SESEPA. You know, from, from Prometheus to Sarah Palin, you've challenged us to really think of how energy consumption is a factor, not just of what we do to our environment or how we spend our money, but who we are as a people, our values, our priorities, our sense of self. Uh, so I am taking a lot away from tonight, and I, I hope that, uh, that all of you agree. Um, I have some special thanks to, to note uh, to St. Mary's Philosophy Department, who is a co-sponsor this evening, and also to the Canadian Business Ethics Research Network, Seaburn, who are also a co-sponsor tonight. Uh, I want to say a note of thanks to Chris Stover, the general manager of SESEPA, uh, without whose hard work and dedication none of these events would happen. 
And you know, th this talk is part of a series on the elements, on how we, uh, how we rely on our food resources and water and oil, and challenging us to kind of collectively think about what that's doing to our society and, and what it's doing to us as people and how we should move forward. Um, a little bit more on CISEPA, so you can find out if you check the, the info table at the back of the room on your way out. Um, you can find more information about CISEPA, you can ha find DVDs of our past events uh, and our annual reports. You can sign up for our mailing list to find out about more of our activities, including more events like this that will be going on in the future. And of course, uh, information is up there about upcoming events in the coming programming year. I also want to encourage you to, and we have a scarcity of evaluation forms uh, and, and a lot of people, but we uh, do have some paper evaluation forms. So if you can get your hands on one, I'd encourage you to grab it and fill it out. They're great value to us at the programming committee. We really do consider all of your input in trying to uh, pick topics and structure the, the programming year. So I'd really encourage you to do that. Uh, and as a final note, please join us in the lobby where you can continue this conversation with Andrew and, and with each other over food and drink. And of course, you can find Andrew's books for sale. Not the current book, which will be available in, in fall, but Tar Sands and, and, uh, and his other books, I believe, are uh, available for sale. So again, thank you very much and sorry. So if, if you didn't hear that, it's, the, the talk is called Touching the Wounds. It is a challenge from a theological perspective to reassess the, the pedophilia crisis within the Catholic Church. I, it looks really fascinating, and it, it is, again, one of those public affairs issues that really co goes kind of to the heart as who we are and how we uh, think about the interrelationship of ethics and the way that we structure organizations and, and, and power. So I'd encourage you to come out Wednesday uh, for that. Uh, and I will see you in the lobby. Anything else? Did I miss anything? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.